Welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort, live at the NASDAQ market site in sleeting, thunder sleeting Times Square. But today, despite the inclement weather, we're going to talk about delivery, kind of this tech culture that's built up around delivery. You're going to hear from Tony Hsu, the co-founder and CEO of DoorDash, in just a bit. I sat down with him. I mean, he is doing big things, just raised more than a half a billion dollars to do a massive build out uh, in delivery. Joining me right here uh, at the NASDAQ, Ed Lee of Recode, Aaron Griffith of Wired. Um, we, lots to dig into because there are so many different players playing at different sides of this. I mean, we had Amazon buying Ring a bit ago, and that made a lot of people think about that really creepy Amazon key video <laughs> about letting people into your house Let's using your technology. House. Yeah, right. but you can see them at least, <laughs> I guess. Um, how do we get here? Let's, let's talk about that first of all. Because I mean, delivery has been a thing, especially in cities for a long time, and even outside cities when it comes to things like pizza. But now we're getting all kinds of things delivered. Aaron? Um, yeah, I mean, this is sort of the one thing that I think Amazon can't control in the sort of ecosystem of selling people stuff and getting it to them. That is the part that I think is the most difficult, the logistics. And so I think they're constantly looking for ways that they can own more pieces of that logistics part. And, you know, getting packages stolen from your doorstep is a big mm. problem. Not knowing if it's delivered or not, miscommunications. That's the thing that Amazon's spending a lot of resources on, trying to, you know, make sure it goes smoothly. And so this is one way that they can own another piece of it. That has gotten good, though, Ed, because I ordered, <laughs> uh, I can't remember what it was. It was either um, one of those surge protector strips right. or poopery, that stuff you spray in the toilet. <laughs> They're the same, so, right, exactly. Yeah, right. it was exactly. one of the two. Which way were you going? Uh, Jane Wells of CNBC <laughs> did a great strange success on that, and so it was at my sister-in-law's house, so I decided we have to have poopery. So now we've got it in three out of four bathrooms. I know you guys needed to hear that. You needed to know. It's good stuff. It works. Uh, <laughs> but but, but uh, I ordered one of these things off of Amazon, and I checked the app to see if it had been delivered. It had. I didn't see it on the doorstep. They took a picture of where they put it behind the flower pot. I was like, nice, it's getting pretty sophisticated. Getting sophisticated also, I think that's actually a pretty good example because you were at a moment, you're, you're like, I need something. And it used to be sort of, you just went to the store for it. E-commerce used to be a different thing. The use case for e-commerce for a consumer was simply, I need it someday. I need it in the next week, month, whatever it might be. And so I need to order in advance. Amazon realized, you know what, the thing that's preventing people from shopping more online is not getting it quick enough, which is why they did Prime, two-day delivery, and then they were like, that's not fast enough either. People are used to just getting it right away, so let's do a same day. Let's do two hour, let's do one hour. So delivery is the key mechanism to unlocking that. You know, So mm. it used to be, you're in e-commerce, you have to have a website and some inventory listed. That's not the issue anymore. The issue now is how reliably can you deliver and how quickly can you deliver it? And I think that's the thing that Amazon's really trying to solve for. That's what Walmart's trying to solve for. They did something similar through their Jet.com division with August Lock, which is another smart lock company. So I think that's DoorDash or Instacart, any of the other startups built around this idea is sort of bridging this gap between bricks and mortar and e-commerce. And I think that's that's the big solve. Here's my grand theory, Aaron, is that <laughs> it's the smartphone that really changed everything when it comes to delivery. Because one, I don't have to be sitting at home at my PC or at mm -hmm. work at my yeah. PC ordering stuff, which I could do. I mean, most of the time when I'm ordering something for delivery, I'm, I'm, I don't expect somebody to bring it to me on the sidewalk anyway. Mm -hmm. But you know, I can more readily just kind of order. But more important, mm -hmm. the people who are doing the delivering have like a mobile dispatch center where they can understand what it is they're supposed to pick up from where, where they have to go, how long it's gonna take them to get there, and they can change things around on the fly. And it finally, this thing finally made it efficient <laughs> for businesses to spring up around this idea. Sure, and I think that's true, and I, and I think Amazon is pushing that even farther by, you know, so now if I think of something that I need to pick up, instead of waiting until I'm at a computer or waiting till I see a store to go into it. I can just order it right away on my phone. And Amazon's making that even easier, obviously, with the Echo, uh, where you can just say, Amazon, I need a new you know, pot or something like that when I'm cooking. And so they, they're, they just want to kind of get rid of the friction everywhere. And you know, one thing to go back to what we were talking about earlier, that this is really important for Amazon, is it opens up a whole new market for them. They currently can't really deliver that much in the way of groceries, um, because you know, they can't have rotting food out on people's doors steps but getting into the home is a way for them to you know basically get into the entire the, the business at Instacart is is kind of winning right now and that a lot of grocery stores are trying to figure out how they can play in it how can they deliver you eggs milk meat that kind of stuff and 
the, the way to do that is to put it straight away into your refrigerator. Ed, do you think the economics work, though? Because there are a lot of companies losing a lot of money on delivering various things, whether it's groceries or people, you know, Uber, Lyft. I mean, they're not making money. Um, you, you got various companies, DoorDash, Grubhub. Grubhub, though, I will mention, and we'll get a little bit into this, its stock has tripled over the past 12 months. It went from $33.88 a share to more than $103 a share today. Delivery, Grubhub, seamless, people right. are hungry. Uh, but does the business model work, and what do you think will have to happen for it to eventually work? Because they say, you know, scale is what's going to do it. That's always, it's <laughs> always the answer, right? Once we get big enough, it'll solve everything, right? Um, I think... I think Amazon still presents the best possibility for this. So the fact that it's used to not making money, for one thing, it's used to investing in businesses that lose money, but that over time, they become so dominant that they can sort of turn it into a money-making or profit-making moment. So I think it's going to be a really hard thing to figure out. I think... But that it, works for Amazon because works for Amazon. they are kind of vertically integrated in that sense. They've got Prime that they lose money on. They contract right. some of that out to, most of it out to shippers. But they, they have the long play on this. Once you separate the delivery piece from, say, the restaurant food, does scale really help you? No, I think that's actually a great point. I think what's, what we've seen so far with things like DoorDash and others is that that's a really hard thing to, to, to achieve, even with scale. Because... When you're hiring workers basically to do the actual delivery, it's, you're not sort of achieving an economy of that scale. You just still have to hire more workers. You have to pay more people. And restaurants are widely distributed. That's the other point. Unless you're owning the restaurant chain in some form or another, you're not getting scale there either. So I think that's going to be a hard thing to do. I think there are sort of attempts with, say, a company like Uber that has scale in one area and then another side where people have scale in actual delivery people or the relationships with the restaurants, whether it's like a seamless or open table it might be. There might be some economies there, but again, I think the margins are so small or non-existent that it's a weird play. And that's, a, that's an important thing, though, to, to remember that these are essentially marketplaces, and they're very regional. So every, you know, a lot of these delivery companies have a dominance in a couple cities or in one region, like even the same way that Grubhub has, you know, they're well, well known in most of the country, but New York is dominated by Seamless, which is owned by Grubhub. But right. We all use Seamless here. And so, you know, I, I think a lot of these places, a lot of these companies might have a regional foothold. And that means maybe there's some consolidation could help with this scale problem. Mm. But the thing is, you do need these two sides of the marketplace. You need the customers, you need the restaurants, you need the workers all kind of together. And you can't really have a good business without all three of those. We are talking delivery in very nasty delivery weather, weather here in New York City, Midtown, Times Square. Aaron Griffith of Wired joins me at Lee of Rico. This is Fort Knox Live. We're talking about this wired delivery uh, tech economy. I wish I could fit Recode in there, but it's kind of a, a weird <laughs> Well, weird you word. need code to get there, right? You do. So, all right, that's what Recoding we'll the delivery economy. And, and so I think that, that's the other piece of it, right, which is we can't think of delivery as its own business in this in this sort of e-commerce chain. Some, for an Amazon to be able to do it, aside from just losing money on that aspect of it, their, their real drive is to get people to buy more stuff. That's mm -hmm. where they win, ultimately. If they have to spend and even lose money or create a cost around the delivery portion of it, they'll do that. But if you're a startup that's purely focused on the delivery part, I, I don't see where that, that profit is coming from. I don't even at the scale part. Yeah, I think that's, that, that's the question. But it certainly is working on that one aspect, at least with me, of getting me to buy more stuff. Because like, I feel like I don't have time to actually go into a store. Right. I went into a Target a couple weeks ago. It was weird. I felt like I had gotten You're into like a an time alien machine. In a strange land. Like, I remember when like I used to go stores? here. Right. Look exactly. at all the things lined up on shelves. It's and like a warehouse. And they're not rearranged in order nice. of your own preferences <laughs> and your browsing history. They don't follow you around <laughs> afterward. <laughs> this is where they make the things. Um, so I want to get to DoorDash because uh, the CEO of DoorDash is actually in town. I don't know if he's getting out of town in this weather, but he's in town right after raising $535 million from SoftBank, Sequoia, GIC, and Wellcome Trust. He told me that he's going to expand from 600 cities where they are now to 1,600 over the next 12 months with this money. Also talked uh, just kind of about the concept behind the company. Take a listen to him. 
Are you seeing that people's tastes are turning toward burritos in a certain town or at a certain time of day? And does that allow you to try to get more of certain kinds of restaurants on the platform? Or the, you know, is it telling you that you need more dashers in a certain area? Like, are there things like that that you were that you were finding that maybe you wouldn't have queried the data for, but somebody else in the company did and said, hey, Tony, we really ought to be doing X, Y, Z, and here's why. Absolutely. So for example, we, we saw, infra so all those macro um, categories that you listed about what restaurants should we add to the DoorDash platform, to how many dashers, in which vehicle types, in what zip codes, you know, um, should we try to recruit for? Uh, what types of uh, consumers are out there and what are their preferences in terms of when they order and how many times they may order? Those are all things discovered uh, through the different people and the power that you know, they were equipped with when they could you know, query the database. When you started out, you had a Google Voice number. We did. That, so somebody would call in because they wanted you know, to order some food and it would ring all your phones and whoever got it first. That's I guess right. would take the order. But along this time, the smartphone became uh, really the key device for um, mobile ordering, mobile delivery, for being able to solve that sort of dispatch and connection problem. How did you incorporate that into your vision? And was there a point where your vision shifted and you had to go, all right, well, you know, this Google Voice number was cool for a while, but we got to do this in an entirely different way. Well, the Google Voice number uh, was just used to test whether or not there was it demand right. you know, for the service. And, and so it really was a hack in that regard. It's something that allowed us to get up and running quickly. You know, the question in my mind was, is it just New York City that wants delivery? <laughs> or or you know, um, does there exist delivery, or could there exist delivery outside of New York City? Um, but you know, regarding the point of mobile, DoorDash would not be here. And the technologies with regards to DoorDash, um, as well as many other companies, uh, similar to DoorDash um, would not be possible without um, the power of a computer inside your pocket. And, 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 on, on, and you listed a couple of them. You know, on, on the consumer front, we are in a time now very similar to where e-commerce was in the mid-2000s um, and, and in terms of how it was really adding convenience to the retail experience mm -hmm. in the restaurant world. That's where we are today. It's just happening faster because people have had now 10 years of practice and a head start, if you will, in terms of buying through wh whichever devices are at their fingertips. On the Dasher front, it used to be in the days of you know delivering pizza. So I delivered pizza for uh, you know Domino's for uh, for a little bit, uh, studying you know how deliveries worked. What, what years were you? It, how old were you? It, it was really measured in weeks, I would say. Oh, okay. Uh, in so 2013, is, in the beginning. So, so this is when you were starting DoorDash. Ago, you know, market research. You, you delivered. There, there, yeah, <laughs> the, 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 the deliveries and, and, and checking in, checking out. You know, was still sometimes done by paper, um, or phone calls. How do you digitize the physical world with paper or phone calls? You know, at DoorDash, we collect hundreds of millions of data points. And we have to know about every pothole, every parking spot. Pothole, really? Yeah, that may slow down traffic. Or every parking spot that make a delivery last a little or take a little bit longer. Every uh, uh, store's... Um, uh, operations in terms of where is the kitchen, how fast or slow is business that day. Hmm. And all of that information you know, now can be digitized for the first time, really, because of the power of mobile. So Ed, powerful stuff. He's saying that, I mean, while they're doing this delivery, they're also looking at where the potholes are, the layout of the kitchen, how busy these restaurants are so that they can stay efficient. It raises the question of, are they also gathering information about what my lawn looks like and do I have cracks in the steps leading up to the door? I mean, eventually there's a privacy question here with delivery here. There's a trust issue. There's a trust issue, and I think that's become sort of a watchword for all kinds of Silicon Valley projects. Um, I think clear, what's interesting about what he's trying to do there is, you know, whatever the, the fees that they're collecting on the actual delivery portion what potentially is more valuable is the data, right? Not just the, the potholes or, or what people are, you know, where people live, but what they're ordering, when they're ordering it, which restaurants they're ordering it from. I think if the play here is ultimately that the fee just subsidizes some of that cost so that they can make 
more value on the data, meaning whether you're selling it to marketers or you're selling it to other restaurant chains or so other e-commerce places, right? That's my question, right? though, is that most restaurants, at least, I mean, are, are, are sort of mom and pop, unsophisticated right. operations. They mm -hmm. don't really know how much money they might even be losing to delivery versus cannibalizing their own in, you know, walk-in orders. And so are they really, I mean, that's been a very difficult business for companies like Groupon, companies like Foursquare, people are trying to sell into restaurants. That's really hard to get them to want to look at the data and figure out how they can optimize their business. I do see the, the play for a big national chain restaurant that might want to get into delivery. That makes a lot more sense. Or that the danger is the mom and pop pizza chain, you know, sort of reveals enough data through their use of a service <laughs> like this where the big national chain comes in. Oh, that's a great spot right. to open up this <laughs> place, right? Yeah. I don't, I'm not saying that that's what the, the attempt is here, but Again, it's like the more data, the better. This is how Silicon Valley tends to think about everything. We're, we're looking at things like, you know, driverless cars, for example. Uber is, a, is at the forefront of that, as is Google. A big part of the thinking in, in these delivery schemes is, well, do you need a driver? Can you just put things into automated uh, driverless cars, have them go to different places, and people come out, pull it out of the, the vehicle as they need? probably a ways off from that, but that's exactly what a lot of these companies are thinking about. Aaron, what do you think Google's play is here? Google Express, like do they just have to be in everything or are they maybe eventually trying to draw a line to value with their driverless car technology where, hey, if you don't need a driver, that's one of the most expensive pieces of delivery and we're already set up. I mean, I, I, I think Google's first play was self-driving car. I mean, they've said this, they, they've hinted at it for a while, and I think they've, they've kind of come out and said they're looking for robo-taxis. They hate that term because it sounds kind of scary, but that's essentially what it is, is a taxi that will drive you around, and they're going to own and operate those as a way to help people get used to the idea of seeing these things driving around and maybe even getting into one of the cars. I mean, once they eventually get into something like, you know, moving goods around or moving food around, that's really far out and by the time we get there I think we'll be a lot more used to the idea but I think that um, for, that's not a huge priority right now I, I don't think that Google is really very experienced in the art of moving physical things around in the world and even a lot of their physical hardware products haven't really been a top priority for the company so I don't see them emerging as a leader in this space I actually think you know a company like Amazon that really does rely on logistics is one that's going to have a lot more of an incentive to get this right first it always comes back to Amazon I feel like I, know, I, know. Coming back like, I hate Amazon. to give them so much credit but they are no, really they, they it's shocking really, how they've become to there's like, a reason why the Jeff Bezos is now <laughs> according to Forbes the rich just 100 billion, billion, right? 112 billion dollars. And, and on this subject, I think an interesting fact to note what happened recently, which is so they bought Whole Foods, right? Whole Foods had this sort of long running a contract with Instacart, which mm -hmm. is a delivery service. And we were all wondering, okay, so how is that going to work out? Because part of the thinking in Amazon buying Whole Foods was, well, they're going to want to deliver stuff through their prime fresh system. Mm -hmm. And like, do they break that contract? Do they pay them out or something? We're reading reports recently about how, well, what's happening in a lot of these Whole Foods stores is that there's the Amazon delivery guys sort of physically pushing out the Instacart delivery guys where oh, they're why? confined to like a hallway somewhere oh, in the store or like in the Are they videotaping that? Because that would be a good show for Amazon be, Prime Instant oh Video, you know? So wow, it's, it's like the competition they're in the flesh. Battle. They're yeah. literally <laughs> muscling them off. And it's, it's not, it, I don't know if it's part of a contract negotiation or something, but clearly like it shows Amazon's ambition and it shows the lengths that they're willing to go to make this happen. But what happen. Instacart has said is that, well, all of the rest of the grocery stores in the country, which, you know, Whole Foods is a tiny portion of that. Right. The rest of the grocery stores in the country want a neutral third party, not an Amazon. Exactly. So that's where they're going to play. So and they believe that's their they're, 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 they're like the Roku of delivery. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. Exactly. Oh, right. All right. Geek metaphor. I love it. <laughs> this is Fort Knox Live. I'm here at the NASDAQ market site with Aaron Griffith of Wired, uh, Ed Lee of Recode. The weather's kind of nasty. So if you see screens flickering and whatnot, that's why in this weather there are delivery people out because this is New York and this is the mobile era and everybody's ordering food and especially when the weather's like this, and, right? Yeah, because you, you don't head want to go out, out, right? Right. I, don't want to I saw I saw a delivery out. guy who had a full-on poncho, like maybe tiny little uh, holes for the eyes, but it was every single square inch was covered. It's also New York. I mean, that's just that's 
the, the sort of the right of living in New York is you're going to have things delivered to you, and I think there's that's two sides too. Some people say it's cruel, but other but delivery people actually like, say this, this is, is when we make the most yeah, money. We get, we get really big tips. tips, and we're busy. I always tip big when it's a bad weather moment. Certainly, <laughs> I mean, I try to as tip as, as big as I always can, but when it's a, mo a weather moment, you always tip a little bit bigger. So Tony Shu's argument is, I think. Well, I know because I just talked to him. But his <laughs> argument is that this is part of a new rung on the blue collar ladder. That yes, these workers don't want to be delivering food for the rest of their lives, but they're college students, you know, they're working their way up to X, Y, or Z. And this is a job that they can kind of do on their own time that helps to get them there. Aaron, what's this doing to our culture, though? This is part of the gig economy. And on the one hand, there's flexibility, but on the other hand, we can't quite not seem good to jobs. figure out. <laughs> but are they as good or better than the bad jobs that <laughs> these workers would have otherwise. Yeah, oh God, you know, there, this has been a debate that's been happening basically since the rise of the gig economy. And, you know, I think we've seen some companies in the gig economy that have decided, listen, we don't want to be a part of this conversation. We just want to hire our employees full time. I mean, there's a, there's a mm. couple companies in New York that do that where they make all of their cleaning people or all of their handymen or whatever be full time employees just to avoid the legal problems that, that we've seen Uber and Lyft and some of these companies deal with um, and just the PR headache. I mean, there was just a report, I think, last week from MIT that said that Uber drivers are, you know, making an average of something like three or four dollars. And then there was a then they there, it was debunked it and, and, right, and yeah, revised, right. but it's still just a constant Eight dollars and something an hour. And but, I don't think yeah. they're ever going to shake that stigma that these are not great jobs. They're definitely not, you know, full-time jobs. A lot of the, there's a lot of sort of like unrest and complaint amongst uh, the employees. So that's always going to be a little bit of a PR headache and. Uh, whether or not it's a long-term uh, positive or negative, I think it remains to be seen. It's certainly a risk factor. I agree. I think. Um, I, I think on the other hand, though, that if, if say like it were a mom and pop type restaurant or pizza parlor that normally didn't deliver quite as much, you know, all of a sudden, oh, there's more sales for them. There's maybe more work for some delivery people. So it might add. It certainly adds to the economy in that way. I think longer term, though, there are bigger questions around. Well. The more you sort of kind of system, systematize certain types of the business, you sort of lower the value of it, hmm. right? And I think it becomes like a commodity position in some way, if you want to argue it. So I think the long-term effects still have yet to be uh, sort of sorted, but you know, the push from the Silicon Valley companies was always going to be like, these are jobs that didn't exist, you know, <laughs> six months ago, a year ago. Which I is strictly argue, speaking true. You know? I so, would argue that we are about to enter a new era when it comes to trying to suss out the value right. of these gig economy jobs, these delivery jobs, and it, it can be boiled down to what DoorDash is preparing to do. They're going from 600 to 1600 in a very compressed period of time, which means suburban and bedroom communities and smaller cities, you know, second, third tier cities that didn't have access to these type of services before, they're about to get them. So can they do it without oversaturating the market with these dashers so that maybe these dashers can actually make a decent wage and hey, eight bucks an hour goes a lot further in Cincinnati than it does in Brooklyn. And they have to they have to recruit the workers. They have to entice them with something that's valuable. I mean, a lot of people have complained that, you know, Uber drivers at first would be incentivized with a lot of, you know, sort of perks and better pay and that that has kind of fallen over time. And, you know, that, that could be the case here, too. Uh, but the, there is a competition for these kinds of workers and for drivers and for Instacart drivers and for, you know, name name the service that you need a delivery for. So. Hopefully, you know, given a marketplace economy, you know, this, these could create better jobs. I think the expansion is certainly smart. It's some, something that they have to do, though. I guess the challenge would be in sort of, like sort of more sparsely populated areas or even just in the suburbs generally, if they can really find good economies of scale there, right? right. I think are there what, enough lazy Are there people? enough, exactly, or are there enough businesses, <laughs> businesses that simply want to make use of it? Right. And I think, you know, Uber has had faced issues in sort of cities that don't, are, are not densely populated enough, right? Mm -hmm. Amazon, for all their sort of expertise in delivering things quickly to you, are seeing that in suburban areas, it's harder for them to get things there faster. It's more concentrated areas that's easier for them to solve. And, you know, you're seeing this, for example, in like, you know, cities in Europe and Asia where there are more people live, you know, more, more of the population lives in big cities. And I think, you know, the, the solution for e-commerce works easier there than in more spread out areas. So I think America itself presents an interesting uh, challenge for e-commerce. So many ways. So many ways. <laughs> Not exactly. just for e-commerce. <laughs> exactly. But I think, so I, I'm curious to see where they end up with that. You know, I think expansion is smart and important, but how they approach Suburban areas versus urban areas, I think they have to take a different model. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to, I don't think it'll scale the right way. What was your last delivery order, Aaron? 
Oh, um, I think I had seamless a couple nights ago. It's pretty, Not pretty, tell regu what you ate? pretty regular uh, Chinese. Ah, and you know, yeah, the, yeah. The, the beauty of it is that I order it on the bridge over the train into Brooklyn mm. and it's at my house by the time I get home. Yeah, it's like a time <laughs> strike, right? Like, yeah. That's <laughs> totally the young person's delivery thing. I mean, I, I don't think. So, I've what did you order? No, I haven't, delu I haven't delivered. I haven't ordered something in like <laughs> six what? months or something. Oh, my what? goodness. You know, no, are you just talking food or even. Amazon. Oh well, Am no. Amazon is like I like practically weekly, yeah. right? Amazon <laughs> is weekly. Like, what was the last thing I ordered? Some light bulbs, I think. The yeah. issue with that yeah. is that you have to put the boxes away. That is like you have to put the boxes away. I think <laughs> <laughs> the amount of recycling, the paper recycling that goes out, it's like everyone's like, and you see the whole block too, the whole stretch. Like, mm -hmm. there's tons of Amazon boxes or and other boxes that are they're they're smashed up. So. You guys know what I ordered, you know. Surge oh, protectors and poopery. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> but food wise, food wise, <laughs> I got a burrito here to the NASDAQ by DoorDash because I was interviewing Tony Shu of DoorDash, who's going to be on the Fort Knox podcast coming up in a couple weeks. This next week coming up is Abe Ankuma. He is a co founder and CEO of Nyansa. They are an enterprise company that's kind of in the Internet of Things space, being able to tell whether these Wi Fi networks in, say, hospitals, or in warehouses, whether they're actually working and whether devices are able to connect to them in a healthy way. Interesting guy, grew up in Ghana, ended up at Caltech, had never used a computer before he got to Caltech. Um, fascinating company. So be sure to subscribe to the Fort Knox podcast. Aaron, Ed, thank you for being with me here at the NASDAQ for Fort Knox Live. For Always fun. Us. All you guys, see you next time. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.